G'day folks, welcome to this quick start guide for Operation Mercury. I'm aware a lot of people have uh, recently purchased Operation Mercury in MMP sale. Some of you may have bought this a while ago and have had it sitting on your shelf. It's a big box game, GTS is quite an intimidating system. This video is designed to get you going as quickly as possible, to avoid this game just sort of sitting on your shelf. So follow along and uh, let's get started. Now the Grand Tactical Series has, has proven itself over nearly a decade to be incredibly diverse, to be able to facilitate the, the replay of many different scenarios, and Operation Mercury is no different. It does have a steep learning curve, it does take some time to appreciate all those sort of nuances in the game. What I'm really doing here is focusing on some of the basics to get you up and running with that first scenario, and get you playing through that first scenario, so you can begin to understand how all these fundamental elements come together. The idea here is to get this set up on your table. I'm going to run through some very bare basics first about units, their trip quality, movement, firepower and so forth. Then I'll run through the setup for the first scenario and then we'll run through an example of play. The idea here is to get this game on your table and to get you up and running with the GTA system and Operation Mercury. Now of course after opening the box one of the first things you need to do is punch and if you wish clip your counters. I recommend sorting your counters into their divisions, basically the background colour, whether it's uh, light blue, a dark grey, brown or cream colour, and then within those divisions divide them into their formations. This is by the coloured band down the bottom. So you may have um, Australian 19th Brigade units which are orange banded. So keep all those orange banded divisions together. Keep all your independent units with a white or black band together. This makes it easier to uh, find those formations and set the game up. Now as a first step, it's important to understand what the various numbers and colours mean on these units. The number in the top right represents the troop quality. 1, 2 and 3 is relatively low. 4 and 5 is most common average. You do have some units with a 6 or 7, which is uh, quite elite. Generally, whenever a unit needs to make a troop quality check, they roll, and they need to roll less than or equal to this number to pass that check. Anything higher means they fail. Now the number below this is their movement allowance, and this comes in three colours. White is a foot unit, they're walking. Black is a wheeled unit, so you can see the wheels on the trucks. And red means a tracked unit, typically heavily armoured tanks and so forth. And they have different movement costs depending on what terrain they're moving through. This is all summarised on the terrain effects chart, I won't go through it. But one thing to keep in mind is that most of these units can form up into a column, which reduces the movement costs of moving through terrain. Being in column makes them more vulnerable, it reduces their firepower rating, it increases their armour rating, but it lets them move faster. Let me talk about that firepower rating and armour rating. So generally units have a, an armour rating which represents their armour and ability to uh, conceal themselves. Some infantry have plus one, which means they're not very good at hiding, not very armoured. Most infantry have a rating of zero. And some uh, infantry, such as the German Volksschirmjäger, will have a negative armour rating. Generally, a defender wants as low a rating as possible. What this means is that when an enemy fires into their area, their attack rating is modified by that armour rating. So a positive rating means that the, the attacker is getting an increase in their chances to hit. A negative rating means that the attacker is reducing their chances to hit. So, positive is bad, negative is good. There are also two types of armour ratings. There are unarmoured, and there are armoured or entrenched units. A unit in an entrenchment will have their armour rating converted to black. Black armour ratings, armoured units, are basically harder to hit whereas unarmoured targets are easier to cause damage against. Now in the top left, uh, most units will have a fire rating. 
anything with a no means they can't fire. So these divisional trucks can't fire at anything. The colour of the box indicates the type of firepower the unit is delivering. Pink means it is small arms fire. Uh, you have many armoured units with a white dual purpose type of gun. You have some AAT guns which have armor blue armour piercing rounds. Some allied infantry have purple light mortars. These are particularly special. Your green firepower are mortars. Then you have uh, orange, which is indirect high explosive. This is long range artillery. You do have some yellow, direct high explosive. Some scenarios have black emplaced batteries. And then you have the brown organic artillery, which is quite flexible. They can both direct fire and indirect fire. Each type of firepower has different effects depending on their range, whether they're targeting an armored entrenched or unarmored unit and other circumstances of their fire. So it's important to kind of memorize what these different things do. Troop quality, movement, armor, and firepower. The smaller subscripted number here is the assault value. It's only really used during assaults and assaults are relatively rare. You'll probably do, probably do 90 direct fire attacks with a firepower before you get to a single assault. So I won't explain that in any detail. The values on your leaders are also important. Leaders put units in command. They can put all units of their formation in command within their command range. The, unit, the number in the top right here is their command range. So any orange banded units or in Operation Mercury Greek units can be in command if they're within seven hexes of this leader. During his uh, activation, he can also activate three independent units. These are white striped units. He can also put in command black striped independent units. This is his command rating. It indicates basically how many of those white striped independent units he can activate when he's active. Operation Mercury comes with a learning scenario, Storming the Castelli, which takes place on an A4 size map. That's nice for learning the, the very basics, um, but it's not, it's not a particularly balanced scenario. It's not a lot of fun. I'd recommend you jump straight into scenario one, head to page 16 of the exclusive rules, and run through the scenario setup uh, focused on the allies. There are only about maybe 20 allied units uh, that's set up on the board, so it's fairly easy to set up. It is a, a much more interesting scenario. It's more fun, and I think it serves as a better introduction to GTS and to Operation Mercury. So this is my advice is to set up here, and that's what I'm going to do in this quick start guide. It has the Retimno map written on the top left corner. Let's open this up and set it up. It's a nice one map scenario. Really, most of the effort is going to be focused around here in the western side of the map. Now take a look at the victory conditions and you'll note that the, to win, the German player needs to control the port of Retimnon and the two airfield hexes on the left and right here. The allied player wins if he eliminates 13 German steps, so keep those both in mind. Now one of the greatest things about the Operation Mercury release is the design of these scenario setup sheets. If you go to the Multi-Man Publishing website, click on Support and then the Grand Tactical Series, scroll right to the bottom where you can see Operation Mercury, and you'll see Scenario Setup Sheets. If you click on this link, you'll be taken to a page full of PDFs. Uh, you find the scenario you want, click on it, and it shows you the specific units you'll need for this scenario. You can pick them all out from your display, line them all up, have them ready to go. It streamlines setup and makes this uh, so much easier for uh, new players, in particular players new to th this game, uh, players who aren't familiar with their formations yet. So it shows you these the particular color bands, the specific formations you need for this scenario. You basically take these units out. If you want, you can print this off and place it on the display. It makes it really easy to get set up and going. Okay, with the scenario instructions in front of you, you can now go ahead and start setting up the units. Simply take the units you need and place them in their setup hexes. Typically, you'll have these uh, battalions and formations setting up in a similar area, so they'll all be close by. 
where the instructions say a unit may set up in an improved position, I recommend you do so. There's no penalty in, in doing so. Uh, and simply take one of these IP markers and place it on top of the unit. It shows that they've sort of established some minor entrenchments uh, and slightly in an improved defensive position. When you need to set up independent units, these are the white and black striped units. The main difference between white striped and black striped are that white striped units count against the activation rating of leaders, whereas black striped units can be activated by these leaders, but they don't count against their activation rating. Now, the activation rating of a leader is the number in their top right corner, just below the number in the red circle. The number in the circle is their activation range, which is how far in hexes they can activate units, and the number below that is how many white striped units they can activate as part of their formation activation. Now in most Grand Tactical Series games and scenarios, every f division will have a, a divisional display like this. You use this to track command rating, dispatch rating, and other sort of assets as attached to that division. And you need basically one of these for each division participating in the battle. Fortunately, with Operation Mercury, to make things easier, there is a single scenario card which tracks the two main forces involved. The Fulcrum Jäger Regiment 2, who will be arriving as reinforcements, and the initial defenders, the Ritimnon Defence Force. And we'll just use this, you can place this just above your map there, perhaps in the ocean, in the sea, to uh, keep track of everything. This also includes the date and time track, so you won't need a separate track for that as well. This is pretty much all you need to get going. You will need your charts and tables, and it'd be handy to have a terrain effects chart somewhere nearby as well. It's also good to have this Grand Tactical Series 2 rule summary handy, mainly, well, for refreshing the rules, but also for indirect fire flowchart, and mainly even for experienced players, this assault flowchart, which you can use as you're playing. So keep that handy nearby. Okay, go ahead and set up the scenario card as well. This includes German airstrikes, which will happen almost immediately. Two Nakut units, uh, rear guards. Dispatch points, command points. Allied rear guards, dispatch point and command points. It also includes the time, starting at 1500 on the 20th of May. Okay, so the scenario instructions tell us to place the German and Allied direct command. It's these two chits here into the cup. It tells us to place the German and Allied events into the cup. And the 19th Australian Brigade, the 1st and 3rd Volksschirmjäger 2 formation activation counters. And it tells us that the Volksschirmjäger 2 Regiment Division Activation Chit is the first chit in place, so we can keep that aside. And where you place this is up to you. I tend to place it right in front of me so I know what's happening. And then I put it off to the side just, and I list them all down as they're drawn. Now prepare your German reinforcements. Now normally if you have a wave of waves of reinforcements, you can place these on the turn track. In this scenario, this is the one wave of reinforcements. They're arriving on the very first turn, and they're arriving on the very first activation, this divisional activation of the first turn. So they're all ready to go. They're lined up in five sticks. This is basically the five drops that will take place. Uh, on this very first activation of the first turn. So they're all ready to go. Now, once you're all set up and ready to go, you can start with that first activation chip. Now, normally, you would go through a sequence of play uh, and you'll start drawing counters from your cup. In this scenario, we're told that this is the first activation counter in play. Now, there are several different types, three main types of activation counters in the cup. There is a division activation, a formation activation, and a direct command. You'll also notice that there are event counters, which I'll get to in a moment. These all work very differently. Uh, they all have very different effects and powers. Think of a division activation as, well, kind of a, a non-combat activation of the bulk of your divisional forces. Anything of that color, any units of that division, can activate. This is also when reinforcements of this division come on, and technically these Germans are reinforcements, so they'll come on when this chit is drawn, as I'm about to do. Formation activations are far more powerful, but more focused. They activate every unit of that formation 
in other words, of this color with this color band along the bottom. The most important, there are three key things to keep in mind with formation activations. First of all, units of that formation can fire on their first action. Secondly, units can do engineering actions as their first action. And thirdly, units can move into the fire zone of enemy units on their first action. Now, having said that, uh, with both of these activations, with both of these uh, counters, units can do their first action, non-combat, combat. They can then be activated for a second action by spending a command point. If they are within the command range of their leader, you can spend a command point from your division display to have this unit perform a second action. And that second action may be to move or to attack. That's the same with division activation and it's the same with this formation activation. Now the direct command chit in effect only gives you that second action. Uh, it's it's a more much more focused uh, combat oriented activation chit. You can, when this chit is drawn, you can spend command points to directly activate individual units of your command that are within the command range of your leader. So it's a much more focused type of uh, activation. You typically won't be doing a lot with this activation. You typically be doing very focused actions of this color band with this activation. And you'll be doing a lot of non-combat oriented activities with this one. So think of these as, as I said, kind of general non-combat with the possibility of spending some second activations to do some combat actions, a much more focused combat oriented activation, and a very focused unit specific type of command that will um, spend your command points. Okay, so we're all set up. Let's get started with play. The first chit in play is this divisional activation. So normally when a division activation chip is drawn, we'll roll to increase, to hopefully increase the command and dispatch points available to that division. For dispatch points, which we typically do first, we roll a die, we halve the number and round down. In this case, zero, and we add their command rating, four. So we'd go up one, two, three, four, they'd gain command points. And this happens almost every turn. With dispatch points, again, we roll a die. If we roll a zero, they get a free dispatch point. Not the case here. If they roll equal to or less than that division's dispatch rating, so two in this case, they would increase by one point. And if they roll less than the division's current number of dispatch points, in this case two, they would get a point. So in this case, they wouldn't get a point um, for that one. They'd just get one point in total because it's equal to or less than their dispatch rating. Now a brief comment on what these points do. Dispatch points are primarily used to purchase formation activations. I mentioned how important these formation activations are. They are the main way you will fire in focused efforts with your formations. So buying these is, is super important. It's where the focus of the fighting is going to be. You will want to spend your dispatch points to buy these. This happens at the start of most turns. It costs two dispatch points to purchase a formation activation to place in the cup for that turn. Alternatively, if you're running low usually, or have something planned for the next turn, you can spend one dispatch point to purchase this for the following turn. So it won't go in the cup that turn, it'll be held over and uh, placed on the turn track for the following turn. You place that so your opponent can't see what you're doing. Now command points are quite versatile. They can be used in various ways to automatically pass troop quality checks. So you can spend a command point to automatically pass many checks that require a troop quality check. Uh, these can be things like possible suppression results on the fire table or converting suppression to cohesion hits, some of the more detailed elements of fire combat. They can also be used to activate units for a second activation as part of a formation or division activation. Uh, again, this is quite costly. You don't have many of these points, but it provides you with that flexibility to give units second, um, second actions. You can also spend those command points in the same way on that direct activation to activate individual units. Now, in all cases, spending these command points in this way 
requires these units to be within the command range of uh, their formation leader. You're spending command points, they need to be in command. So those, those leaders and their command range is something you should always be keeping your eye on. With the divisional activation, reinforcements come onto the map. And of course, with this scenario, it begins with this wave of German reinforcements, in effect, coming to invade Crete. We take them one stick at a time. We check where they arrive. And I know that stick one arrives within one hex of 1715 and or 1915. Now, it's pretty much right in front of me just here. So they'll be arriving within one hex of these areas, somewhere kind of around here. So tactically, they're keeping to the road. Uh, ideally, they want to try to land. It'd be nice if they can land kind of in open areas because, as I'll point out in a moment, orchards modify their drop. 1715, 1915. We'll put those guys in the orchards there. Now, technically, before I place them, we need to roll to see how uh, successful their drop is. Something to keep in mind is units cannot stack, so they have to land one unit per hex. They cannot land in column or mounted. And of course they can't land in a hex containing an enemy unit. And if for some reason they're forced to do so, the German unit is eliminated. So for each unit, we simply roll and consult the airdrop glider table here. For this unit, we roll. They have a four, and we check the modifiers. We check if there are allied units projecting a fire zone onto the drop zone. We check if there's an allied AA unit projecting a fire zone. If they're landing in an orchard or a vineyard, scrub or village hex, no. So there are no effects to this one. They're landing in the clear without any sort of allied units projecting a fire zone. It's a four. It's less than seven. They land without effect. But of course, every paratroop, paradrop landing has a paradrop marker placed upon it. These paradrop markers, in effect, represent the, the delay and the chaos of their immediate landing. I'll explain this in just a moment. Let's move on to this next one. They're landing in the clear. No modifiers again. They roll a one. No effect. It's a good landing. All right, let's roll for this unit. They again, not in a fire zone. Landing out in the open. Um, yeah. Are they rolling nine? Okay. So a roll of nine on the glider chart is a, another paramarker. So they normally would place one paramarker. Now they just flip it over and there are two paramarkers. This is, in effect, it's a very chaotic landing and it's a greater delay. Now in Operation Mercury, it costs an action to remove these paradrop markers. So as part of this first divisional activation, these units are placed as reinforcements and then they get one action. Normally when you place reinforcements, they use that action to move along roads onto the board towards the, the focus of fighting. With paradrops, you're just basically spending that action to remove these paradrop markers, which I'll do in a moment. Now this one having two paradrop markers, they'll effectively flip or remove one of their paradrop markers, leaving them with one, which will mean that they'll be slightly more delayed than the rest of those units. Now, one of the rules in the Grand Tactical Series, is that you cannot do the same action for your first and second activation. So I can't spend a command point to remove that second paradrop marker as part of that division activation. I'll have to wait until the later formation activation and put this unit in the command of my leader. Now the penalties, you'll notice I put this leader on the board, so all these units are now in command, or well, when they arrive they're in command. The penalties for being out of command aren't too onerous, it mainly means that units can't spend command points. If that leader wasn't there, he hadn't arrived yet, these units are out of command, not in command, and thus they cannot spend those command points for any of those command point purposes. Okay, let's move on to look at the last two. We roll, it's a one, they're in a village, so it's a plus one modifier, but no other effect, so we just place a paradrop marker. Now, this is another important unit. This is a dual purpose, uh, flak gun, very powerful, and they currently have line of sight to these uh, Australians out on the edge here. Okay, the last unit landing rolls a one. They're in an orchard, so it's plus one, but no other effect. Okay, so we have their reinforcement locations determined and their drop effects. And again, there's only really one adverse effect out here on the left. 
All of these units now get one divisional action, and for the most part, they'll use that one or first action to remove the power drop markers. It's as easy as that. That's their action, that's their action. Their action is to remove one power marker, and they now have one left. But in some cases, we have an option to do a second action. So these units out here on the right are in command. They're within the command range of this leader. They can do a first action. Now, immediately, they can determine if they want to do a second divisional activation by spending a command point. So let's have a go at this. I'm going to spend a command point, keeping in mind they're in the command range of a leader. They're an independent unit in the command range of a leader they want to fire so they can't repeat the same action the first action was to remove a power drop marker so that's fine now whenever you make a fire attack whether it's direct fire indirect fire or opportunity fire you look at this combat results table and the various modifiers direct fire is probably the the most common type of fire but then you also have a lot of opportunity fire artillery units use indirect fire and basically it's a very similar system with some slight variation depending on what type of unit is firing. In all cases, you'll start with the attacking unit's fire power value in the top left corner there. You'll look, of course, on the appropriate column. Taking that fire power rating as a starting point, you will modify this number by various uh, attacker and defender modifiers. You will look to see if it's a two-step unit, if it's eligible for a company bonus. It's passing a troop quality check. If they pass, they add plus two to their firepower rating. There are terrain modifiers, usually negative. So it might be a negative one, a negative two perhaps. There may be modifiers for a unit being in column. It's a plus two modifier. This is probably the trickiest uh, modifier. It is range versus unarmored or range versus armored. If you're firing at an unarmored it's so like an infantry target at an adjacent hex, which is most common. There's no modifier, but it's minus one for each additional hex beyond the first. So at range two, it's a minus one. At range three, it's a minus two and so forth. Versus unarmored targets, when firing at an adjacent target, there's no modifier. If firing at the last hex in your range, in this case two, it's a minus two modifier. Now for some armored units with a greater range, anything in between is minus one, regardless of whether it's, you know, this maximum range might be four, range two or three will just be a minus one modifier. You then apply the defense rating of the target, might be zero, minus one, and so forth. If there are multiple steps in the hex, you apply a mass modifier. So it's easier to hit um, dense really kind of like uh, lots of units in a hex. Uh, if it's a night turn minus two modifier, uh, there may be various unit status markers such as improved positions or entrenchments. Some scenarios in Operation Mercury apply supply status and then there's minus two for counter battery fire, which I'm not going to talk about in this instant. So you apply all these modifiers to that initial firepower rating. That gives you a final number and you need to roll equal to or less than that number to cause some damage. Let's say that number is four on the small arms column. You need to roll a four or less, and these are the possible lists of results. If you roll a five, six, seven, or eight, no effect, so you ignore those. You need less than that target number. And you'll cause a cohesion hit, a possible suppression, or a suppression result. And they're all summarized on this charts and table sheet. They're going to fire at these Australian units over here. This is a direct fire unit firing at range. Their range is the little three up in the top left corner. This is a dual purpose gun, direct fire. It is a two-step unit, so we need to check for possible company bonus. Whenever you check for company bonus, you simply roll the die, and they need to pass a troop quality check. In this case, they pass, so they now have plus two to their fire rating. So this four goes up to six. We're firing at this unit here, so we take the terrain effects modifier. They have minus one because they're in a scrub, minus one because they're in an improved position, and no defense rating on that unit, or a defense rating of zero, so no further modifiers. Now, it is ranged fire versus an unarmored unit. So it is minus one for each additional hex beyond the first. So this will be 
0, minus 1, minus 2. So it is in effect 6 minus 2 for the terrain and defense ratings, minus 2 for range. This brings this fire down to 2 or less. There's also a possible mass modifier, a knight modifier, end unit status and supply modifiers, but none of those apply in this stage. So we simply roll the dice, so it's a miss. Again, my target number was 2, so I needed 2 or less to hit. Anything greater than that is a miss. And I spent a command point to do so. And again, this is a, an important unit. They have a good fire power type and a decent fire power rating. So that's why I've decided to fire with that unit on the first turn. I could do the same thing with my machine guns here. They have a range of two, so they could fire at the same unit. And a slightly improved firepower, but they're on small arms. Small arms is pretty decent against unarmored target, but as it is, I've already spent one command point. I only have two left, and I want to conserve those for now. So, I go through the rest of the units, one action. I could take a second action, they're in command. I choose not to. This unit over here does a first action. They're in command, they could do a second action, they choose not to. So with the landings done, and that first division activation out of the way, we're ready to move on to the, uh, the next chit. With the division activation done, we simply shuffle these up and draw the next activation counter, and it is the 19th Brigade. So let me demonstrate how these uh, dispatch and command points work. We simply roll a die for command, we halve that number round down, it is 3, add it to their command rating is 4, they get 7 points and are pushed up to 10. We now roll for their dispatch rating, it's a 3. So it is not 0, it is higher than their dispatch rating, and it is higher than their current dispatch points, so they get no bonus dispatch points. So keep in mind, divisional activations, like this one, are focusing on non-combat actions. In particular, if these units move, they can't move into the fire zone of enemy units. So this flak is basically blocking this, uh, this area here from these allied units. Let's think about the objectives as well. The Germans want to capture these two hexes of the airfield, so the Allies need to get into this area and stop them moving up. There are also Germans up the back here who are trying to come in from the east. Most of these Allies are pretty happy where they are. They're in good defensive terrain with good improved positions. So most of them want to stay where they are. We do have some organic artillery over here and an armoured unit here. Now the armoured units in Operation Mercury aren't particularly powerful, they're most beneficial because of their range, the potential for opportunity fire, and their defensive benefits. Minus two armor rating, and they're black. You'll notice the distinction between a non-armored unit with a white rating and an armored unit with a black rating. Armored units are much harder to hit and to cause step losses on. We also have all these Greek units, and as I mentioned earlier, they are in command if they're in range of any allied leader. So take note of their command range of 4 and 6. Uh, Campbell in particular up here will be able to put in command all of those Greek units. And keep in mind, these Greek units activate under a division activation, not under a formation activation. And they need to think about what they want to do. And uh, again, a lot of things you could think about. But what I'm going to do, just to demonstrate this, is to bring the 1st, 5th and 2nd, 5th out to the left and move the 1st, 4th, and 2nd, 4th out to the right to focus on the eastern end of that airfield. Now, to activate a unit, you simply pick which unit you want to activate and decide what you want to do with it. And for the most part, uh, I'm moving these units. So I look over at the terrain effects chart. Uh, let's start with this unit here. I notice that there are there is scrub in front of them. Now, this is a foot unit. Notice that below their troop quality rating is the number four. This is their movement allowance. Scrub takes two of their movement points. So they can go one, two, three, four. If foot units want to cross a slope, as you can see here, it is plus two movement points if they're not uh, in column. So it'll be one, two, three, four to get that slope. Basically takes their entire movement. I'll leave those as they are just to demonstrate that, but I'll also show you a much better way to do it. As part of their movement, units can spend one movement point 
to place themselves in column. It's effectively a, a marching formation. It allow, allows them to, to move through terrain much more quickly. So that's one to do that. And once they're in column, it reduces the, uh, the movement cost of moving through much terrain. So now that scrub, instead of costing two, just costs one. And they can go one, two, three keeping in mind it took them one movement point to get into column. Now, stacking enables just one unit in column per hex, and you can't move, th a unit in column can't move through another unit in column. That stacking applies at all times, so it kind of blocks many roads and, and passageways. We'll do the same over here. We will place this unit in column. One, two, three, four. Again, we're looking to get this fifth out to the left and we'll do the same with these guys. Now one of the best advantages of being in column is that there are considerably reduced costs for moving on roads. A foot unit in column moving along a road pays just half a movement point per road hex. So it's one to put them in column, one and a half, two, two and a half, three, and they have to stop there because they can't move into this hex because it's in the line of sight of that black gun. A unit can only spend movement points to enter or exit column once in their turn. So these guys have spent a movement point to enter column. They can't spend another movement point to leave column. There is, however, a kind of convenient exception to this, and that is that units can take a cohesion hit to exit column. And I'll do that to demonstrate how this works. You remove the column marker, place a cohesion hit. And this reflects the, I guess, the disruption of the units, these units rushing to get out of column in a hurry. Now I could have waited until their next activation, but let's say these Greeks are really in a hurry to get out here and get out of column. You'll notice that units in column have a plus two defense rating. Remember, this is a bad thing. Units want negative defense ratings. So taking these guys out of column in decent defensive terrain helps them on the defense, whereas these units over here are quite vulnerable, but there's, there's a lot of blocking terrain here, so these Germans won't be able to seize them for some time, and they feel quite safe behind the lines. One more 1st, 5th infantry unit over here. Again, they are going to spend a movement point to get into column. One, two, three, and they'll stop there. A little bit riskier, but still behind the lines and feeling quite safe. Column is particularly important for wheeled and tracked units. The red movement number here means this is a tracked unit. Wheeled and tracked units uh, cannot move through certain terrain unless they're in column. In addition, the movement costs for moving through certain terrain, so this tracked unit here, will pay four movement points to move through or to terrain, if not in column, or just one if it is in column. So, I'm going to place this armoured unit in column one, and then they're going to go two, one and a half, sorry, one to get in column, one and a half, two, three, they now occupy the airfield and they'll take that cohesion in, as I showed earlier, to leave column. Another consideration is that units in column never gain the benefits of defensive uh, terrain they're in. So whilst this scrub orchard might normally provide a minus one defense modifier, it's negated by that unit being in column. They're not hiding in the terrain, they're out in column on the road and exposed to enemy fire. Now, these 1-4 one, uh, one, and 2-4 Greek units are going to shift out to the right to help defend the eastern end of the airfield. And I'll just do these quite quickly. Uh, they'll go 1-2-3-4. Again, I could put them in column, not worrying. 1-2-3-4. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. And one, two, 
three, four. So you can see just how quickly those units in column moved compared to these, this group here, which I moved entirely without being in column. Now, as I've highlighted, uh, units can, any of these units could have spent a command point to do a second action. However, being so far from the enemy, there's not a great deal they can do. Units can't, so these Australians under here, can't move adjacent to this unit because it's in their fire zone. However, we do have some allied units, such as these guys here, who start set up directly adjacent to these German Volksschirmjägers. Now, it's a non-combat command, again, keeping that in mind, so they can't attack on their first action. So there's potentially a lot more I could do with this uh, division activation, but for now, pretty happy to call it done. Uh, there are some Greek units out in the left, the police near the Timnon, but I'm going to uh, leave them uh, where they are just for the time being. Okay, next chit drawn is a formation activation. So as I mentioned earlier, formation activations are some of the most important activations you can do. Uh, they give you that free uh, first action direct fire. You can move directly adjacent to enemy positions or into enemy fire zones on that first activation. Um, you can also do engineering actions if you wish, and then you can follow up where you want with second actions. Now you've got a lot of choices here. Uh, you could fire again with this uh, flak gun. You could attempt to move them closer. You may have noticed that range penalty is minus two at this range. If they try to get a bit closer, it'll reduce that penalty by one, so they'll just have a range of minus one to hit this, uh, this unit. I'll show you how this works. So let's say that as one of my independent activations, this unit wants to try to move into this adjacent hex. To effectively prolong into an adjacent hex, that's what that little star means, they need to pass a trip quality check. So they roll a dice, they roll a four, they succeed, and they move up. Now I could have spent, because they're in command, I could have spent a command point to automatically pass that, and because they're an important unit, I may, if I had more command points, I often will do that just to ensure they, they pass that. If they fail, they don't move, and they suffer a cohesion hit, which will reduce their firepower, which is kind of what I'm trying to avoid here. These machine gun units can fire in here if they want, but just to demonstrate how this works, I'm going to move right adjacent to these enemy units. Again, checking for opportunity fire, and I think we're all good. There are no ranged allied units quite in this area. Keeping in mind, mortars, the green units, don't opportunity fire. One of the few units in the games in the game that don't opportunity fire. So, I mean, these machine guns didn't have to quite move adjacent. They're now moving out into the open and out of good terrain. They could have stayed right where they were and fired. I'm just kind of demonstrating that on a formation activation, you can move into an enemy fire zone on your first action. Again, I could do the same thing here, I could move, but they're right next to this uh, quite vulnerable organic artillery. So they would most likely want to fire. My mortars up here would want to do an indirect fire. Let me show you how that works. Although they're out of range, they can activate on a, for their formation activation. And although they're out of range, they can fire as their first action. Mortars use any unit of their formation to spot for them. So these, this, this uh, Volksschirmjäger unit here is going to spot this organic artillery. Even, even then, they have line of sight to this unit. There are two-step units, so we check for company bonus. They fail. So they're rolling at three plus two for the defense rating of the unit, minus one for the scrub. So it's a net modifier of plus one. Needing a four to hit, they succeed with a direct hit. And this is a green artillery on an unarmored unit causes one step loss. As this is a one step unit, we've just eliminated that quite valuable allied artillery. Now, another important effect of this type of indirect fire uh, from green, from uh, orange indirect high explosive units from organic, organic artillery firing indirect fire is they place a barrage marker. Barrage markers are very important elements of the Grand Tactical series. They effectively block line of sight. They penalize units in that hex. Uh, they are very good on the offense. You can 
block defensive units, stop them seeing you, particularly if they're ranged units. That make it more difficult for enemy units, or all units in fact, to move through that hex, but it's their blocking of the line of sight which is, is quite critical. Um, you can effectively set up a, a smoke barrage in front of your units as they advance, which will prevent enemies from opportunity firing. Uh, I've got a separate video just on barrage markers and how important they are if you want to check those out. And once again, this unit way up here, despite being way out of command range, still gets their first action for the formation activation. They will put themselves into column formation to make it quicker to move through this clear terrain. Otherwise, it's just going to be one, two, three, four. So they go one, two, three, four. And they're trying to get closer to the rest of the units of their formation. And again, they're out of command, so they don't, go, they don't get a second activation. Now... In terms of second activations, units have to make the decision to take a second activation the moment they activate and complete their first activation. So I moved this machine gun earlier. They could have, at that moment, as I said, made the decision to take a second activation, spending a command point. But I can't, having done other things, return to them now and then take a second activation. As soon as they've done their activation, they're done for the turn, for the for the chit. You can't uh, return to them later on. Okay, so we draw our next counter and it is the German direct command. Now again, as I said earlier, I can spend a command point to activate a non-independent unit, so I can't activate these guys again. I could, for example, activate some of these paratroopers out on the left. I could activate this unit here to fire. I could activate any unit that is non-independent to do an action. However, generally this is not a, uh, unless you have a unit really in a critical position, perhaps suppressed or with a great firepower rating that can do a lot of damage to a unit, perhaps finish it off, you generally don't want to spend command points here just to move around. Um, it, usually you're reserving this for directly critical actions. So I'm going to pass on this and not do anything. And we go to draw the next counter out of the cup and it's a random event. Okay, so in Operation Mercury, when you draw the random event counter, you simply draw a random event from a chip or bag. In this case, I drew this one from the bag, which is a heroic unit. Now this effectively increases the troop quality of a unit by plus one, and it reduces their armor rating by minus one again. This is a good thing. And I can place this on one friendly unit. Now, I might think about what unit I want to increase the troop quality and reduce the armor rating for. I'm focused on the airfield here, um, and this is the closest infantry. They are very close, they could be very important. I'm going to place that on that unit there. Tempted to place on the machine gun. My thinking here is these guys have already have a very good uh, troop quality rating. They'll be in the thick of it. I think they're going to need that extra troop quality. Okay, so that's five activation chits down. There are still three more to go, and of course you will draw two more, and the last one will stay in the cup at the end of the turn, and it will be the first chip drawn on the following turn. At the end of the turn, you'll again remove barrage mark, you'll advance the turn track to the next turn. At the start of the 1700 turn, you'll be able to buy more dispatch points. You'll, you'll be able to spend those dispatch points to place activations into the cup. So the Germans, for example, may want to spend two dispatch points to place this formation in the cup, or they may want to spend one dispatch point to place this in the following turn, and one to place the other formation in the cup for the following turn. A lot of choices there in what you, you can do, what you want to do, where you want to focus your attention, and how you want to go about seizing that objective. So that is the quick start guide for Operation Mercury, part of the Green Tactical series. I've really focused on uh, the some of the specific rules for Operation Mercury, like para drops, Greek units. Um, and of course the Operation Mercury scenarios and scenario cards and so forth, but many of the basics that I've covered here are applicable for most games in the Grand Tactical series. Keeping in mind that there are two versions of the rules. There is version 1, which is where eagles dare, 
the Devil's Cauldron, and No Question of Surrender. And then they upgraded the rules to Series 2. And there are some subtle differences between the two, which I won't go into. They largely revolve around activating independent units. Um, but uh, yeah, you'll have to check that out uh, at another time. Hopefully this has got you going. Hopefully by the end of this video, you're uh, getting your map out, setting it up, and getting started. I've tried to give you sort of a, kind of a basic structure to get going. From that point, it's really up to you to make decisions on how you approach this scenario, uh, how you'll capture this airfield, how you'll capture a Timnon, uh, what you'll do with your formations. There's a lot of open decisions involved in this grand tactical series. I think that's one of the great strengths of this series is the the, the wealth of decisions you can make. So uh, yeah, hopefully this has got you started and I hope you enjoy it.